I'm from a big, large family. My father had 18 kids and three wives. We all grew up in a very strong family, Muslim. And even still now, my father go to Mecca at least once every three months. So at age four, we start going to Madrasa. And by age 14, we all memorize the whole Quran. And pretty much praying five times a day did the Ramadan, the Laid al kabir everything a Muslim should do, we did it in our house. And pretty much we was very happy because the only thing we know was about Allah. And we follow Allah, like we know even like it is black and white for us, what just everything was about Allah. And we had the really, we don't know who is Allah, but we just follow what the Imam told us to do, especially when you memorize the Quran. And uh, after finishing the Quran, my father gave everybody like a graduation presence and was to go to Mecca. And uh, it took us like three months to get prepared to go to Mecca. And uh, truly when you get at the airport in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, you are really happy because you are about to see the Holy Land. Go and see where the Prophet Muhammad lay and all the sites you have to visit uh, and to just found out you are part of the elect Muslim because Islam has five pillars to confess, to pray, to do the Ramadan, and to give to the poor, the charities and if you can, to go to Mecca at least once in your lifestyle yes. if you can financial because it costs a lot of money to go to Mecca and you need to be very physical, good to go to Mecca so it's not everybody can do that so to find out you can go to Mecca for 21 days to the Holy Land. It is really emotional and touching. And uh, when you come back home, you feel really you are different than any other Muslim because you accomplish the, the Hajj. So really, you immerse in the society to learn more about Islam and try to understand about Islam. It is September 11. After September, the event of September 11, I was watching TV with my roommate, uh, and we all was uh, devout Muslim. And I was very touched, and some like uh, what happened September 11, and to find out was some people call themselves a Muslim. So I really start to think about why this is happening. I really was a battle to find out was first the Muslim who did this thing. People who called themselves Muslim who did these things. Huh? And uh, I really was, uh, I went back to the Quran and really read the Quran. If it's really the Quran, kill to, to really teach to kill the unbelief. And really I found out uh, we have a lot of chapter in the Quran, chapter four, five, nine. Say kill and believe wherever you found them. So I really started thinking about this book. Why a book gonna say, especially to killing the innocent. Why we have to do that? What in the what religion? Especially since everybody say God love everybody. Why kill? That is the best way to witness people. And this is I just uh, went and just starting to think to pray because I really don't understand those chapter. And there's no way we can take off those chapter in the Quran because they are in the Quran. They are in the Quran, it is they are there. So I just went and prayed, starting really to think a lot about Islam. God sent a strong Christian man in my life, we become good friend, and start talking about politics. Islam first before Christianity, and then we came to Christianity. And really when we come to Christianity, he witnessed me about Christ, about Christ, but I need more than that. I decided what? Since he know the the Bible, I know the Quran. Can we agree just to check the evidence, like as an intellectual way, check the evidence of what we have in the Quran and what we have in the Bible? And truly, after checking the evidence of the four gospel, the people who wrote the four gospel, checking the evidence of Christ and checking the evidence of Muhammad and the Quran, it is day and night. We have like thousands of evidences when it comes to Christianity and the Quran 
you don't have no evidence. And to understand, to get to the point to understand, the first book after Christ has been wrote just less than 20 years after his death. And Muhammad, 250 years after his death. That is really start to clash in my ear. And then I just immerse myself in checking the evidence from the whole Bible and from the whole Quran and how the Bible makes more sense than the Quran. That is really push me to understand, okay, you know what? I live in the 21st century. And since I just took the example, when we go to the courthouse, the judge wants the facts and the evidence before they believe for everything. So I saw myself not before I believe in something, I need to have fact and evidence. And since I never been exposed when I was young about Christianity, because I grew up in a very devout Muslim family, it is just about Islam. But now I'm exposed for everything. And I check by myself, I check by myself the evidence. But I lost the case because what I found out in the Bible, the whole Bible has only one title, the redemption. And the whole Bible talk about the life of Christ. It is, 60, it is 66 books, but all of them about Christ. Both by almost 40 different people, but everything about Christ. And the other turning point, before Christ or Muhammad came in this world, even the pagans know something about God. They have it's just a feeling or thinking about God. But we had someone who came in this world and said he's God. And he did what people predict thousand years and he was raised from death. So I believe this guy is God. I don't need to be first grader. I don't need to be in university to just decide who's real. And it is only in the Bible I found out God loves his enemy. He loves, he hates sin, but he loves everybody. And he wants everybody to repent in this world. But the Quran states, God do not love his enemy. And the most important thing in this life is to love each other. And I found out this in the life of Christ. When the two become very clear for me, Christ is God. It was around midnight, Easter Eve. I just went out in my out of my apartment and look at the sky. Saw all those stars. Saw the beauty of this life. I say tonight. I decide. Tomorrow morning, I will go to church after the service, give my life to Christ. I was so happy because I'm free and I know if I die, I don't have no doubt. I know where I'm, have, where I'm going. I have the insurance. And this is thing I didn't get in Islam. I don't know where I will go. I just have to walk, to walk, to walk. And I don't know where to stop. And I don't know what I need to do. But coming to Christ, it's nothing I had to do. It is a free and I know where I will go. So I was so happy. I wasn't convert. I don't believe in conversion. I was saved. So I was just just imagine the joy to be saved, to be free. My relationship with God, it is a personal relationship. I don't have to pass anymore by the Imam or by someone to talk to God. I can just talk to God wherever I am. And I know what God wants me to do. I didn't do nothing to deserve my salvation. The salvation is free. But I have my, my Bible. Everything He wants me to do, it is there. It is the clear, clear crystal. I know I have personal relationship with God. I can talk to Him through prayer. And He asked me to love everybody. So being saved, I just, it was clear for me, everybody are equal in this life and you have to love everybody. And the only purpose I have in this life is to witness people about Christ. The rest of my life I decide to make sure the Muslim, people who don't know Christ, know Christ before they die. Because that's become the most important thing for me. I love everybody and I want everybody to be saved before they die. So I commit my life for the rest of my life. This is going to be my mission. It's just to go wherever I can go in this world to witness about Christ. I would love to tell all my Muslim friends, thanks God, today 
we don't have to go to anyone to check the evidence about Christ, about Islam. Just open up our heart and our mind to be thinking mind and to check the evidences. And Christ loves everybody because we need to understand if we have just to walk, to walk, like Islam say, on the day of judgment, God, since everybody has two angels, and the angel, one is a report your good deed and one your bad deed, what is good enough for God? We don't know what is good enough for God. So, do we want to be sure where we're we gonna go, or are we still gonna be walking toward where we don't go? And I pray for you guys every day. And Christ love you. He came down here to die for us. And the salvation is free. And please open up the door to your Christian friend. Talk to them. I don't ask you. Nobody can convert you from Islam to Christianity. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. But can you just give people a chance? Open the missionary. Open the door to those missionaries. There are people who love you. Talk to them. Because Christ loves you and Christ sends those people to your doors. You never know. Maybe God is going to talk to you through those people. I was Muslim. And uh, as usual, we went to the mosque every Friday. And, uh, you know, we have to pray five times a day. And during Ramadan, then we, 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 we fasted and uh, we enjoyed uh, Ramadan and we enjoyed the, the, the prayer after 6 o'clock in the afternoon, in the evening, uh, with the kids having fun. We have to go to the mosque. We go to the mosque. And uh, when we eat, remember, don't eat pork. And do not eat pork. It is haram to eat pork. I believe in Allah. Uh, I know Allah is God. That's all I know. And Muhammad is the Prophet. That's all I know. But there's no real relationship. There's no communication be between me and the person called Allah. Uh, there's no relationship. It just I have religion. I was Muslim. That's it. One time when I was still Muslim. And I was invited to help a Christian studio recording to uh, help them to play some guitar music for Christmas. So I went to the studio and they started with prayer. And they never asked me what do I believe, what did I believe. They never judge me, they never ask me, they just make good friends. This, this man, Herman, he became my good friend, him and his wife. One time after recording session, he invited me for dinner. So I went to his house after dinner. He said, "You want to stay here a little bit longer because we, you are going to continue until midnight or until in the morning tonight, finishing the project recording. If you want to stay here a little bit longer, we're gonna have a prayer meeting about one hour." So I said, "Sure, why not? He's my good friend. He's my good friend." So I have that open mind. I stayed there and. So they have a prayer meeting, they read the Bible, they share a little bit and they started praying and they prayed for me. It was something different, something that never happened in Muslim families. Friends pray for friends. It was amazing. In the middle of the prayer, he said that, Rene, do you have something like charm or idols? I was very sure. I said, how do you know? The Holy Spirit told me. What do you mean Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit is Rohul Kudus. Roh Kudus as in, in Arabic. Rohul Kudus. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. There's no such a thing. Ho Holy Spirit spoke to you, speaks to you in Muslim religion. But he said, Holy Spirit told me that you have charms and idols. I, yes, I have. Do you want to be free from that stuff? What what do you get out of that stuff? So, well, I have power. I can stab my stab with knife, and it will not hurt me. I will not be bleeding. Wow! Do you know that dark dark power? Do you want to be free from that? I, said, I want to, but I'm afraid with my teacher. So, so well, if you want to, give it to me, and I will burn it. I said, I was very 
scared. The teacher gonna get mad at me, and I will be in trouble. And the power in those stuff gonna attack me. And this guy said very firmly, with the name of Jesus, you will be free, and you will be set free indeed. Wow, I was trembling. I was trembling when when I gave that stuff to him. And little knife. So uh, we prayed together, and he burned those stuff. The name of Jesus is really something, you know, that I have never experienced it before. So we continue our friendship, me and this guy and his wife, day by day. I started growing. I started having that interest to join him, to be his good friends. He was really my first uh, mentor about Jesus. Now I started attending a Calvary Baptist Church uh, in my city. Uh, all the atmosphere of, of course, is, it was very different. Very different. One time we have a revival program. We have a, the pastor of the local church preach. It was simple passage from John 3.16. For God's all of the world that He gave His only Son, for whosoever believe in Him should not perish, perish but have eternal life. But uh, after the preaching, He gave invitation. So I just walk forward. I feel I feel like I'm a Christian now. I came forward. Still, it was not really something big that I've been born again. Not yet. But I feel like I'm a Christian. I've received Christ. But uh, there's not uh, not the climax yet. I'm a musician since I was little. I made good money recording, and I played on TV every month. Once a month, I have my own show, one hour show. In fact, I like like a talk show, guitar talk show, because that okay money I make. My friends are all just like ants come to sugar. <laughs> you know, I was sweet because of money. I enjoy life. I had my own music school, I had my own building, I had my cars, I had my own house. Then I I and it came into a miserable life because of the fame. Because of the friends I had. Because of the money I had. Yeah, you know, there is a big loneliness in me. Huge loneliness. I don't know where I was going. I had all things I wanted to have. You name it. And I was only 20, 22 years old. And I started searching something seriously. Something is missing in my life. Okay. Until one time, because I was so disorganized, enjoying life so much, then my business started going down. Started going down. Then I, knew, I realized that I need something bigger than what I have. And then I started attending church regularly. Still, it doesn't mean that I've been born again. I know that I received Christ a long time ago, but I'm not so sure whether I have been born again or not. Now, here, something was happening to me. I got cirrhosis of belief. It is not because I drank, I never drink. I, well, I drink beer, maybe only one cup a month. It will not you get cirrhosis of the liver. But I guess Rosa of the liver of because of my hepatitis B. This is the way God's calling me. Rene, you have received me several times, but are you really born again? It was it seems like it was what the Holy Spirit said to me. Now, and the doctor said that you only have five months left to live. That is the thing that telling me, Rene, be ready. Your life is coming to an end. No, I cried. I believe that was the, my turning point. I said, Lord, if you want to take me, take me anytime I'm ready. Because I know I have you. That is a big sign that I was born again. I know I have you. But if you want to use me, I need my health back, I said. And if, if I get my health back, my music is yours for the rest of my life. That is my commitment. 
that night I went to sleep at one o'clock, which is unusual. My tummy is big because of serious of deliver. So painful I, I I had to scream every single night. I said, Lord take care of my, my child. And I cried every single night. My mom said, Rene, you can do it. You can do it. Look at your son. He needs you. Boy, there was the woman from God. And then that night I went to sleep at one o'clock and I woke up, I heard a voice saying, Rene, you are being healed. You are being healed, not you are healed. That means there's a process will happen. In the morning we were supposed to go to the hospital. My wife asked me, How do you feel? I, said, I feel better. So we went to the hospital, get out from the hospital. She asked me again, How do you feel? I feel better. I said, what did they give you? I said, they give me nothing. I said, they just use all day. Check my eyes, check my tongue, and draw some blood and weigh me and uh, check some my, my, my blood pressure. They didn't give me nothing. And I told my wife, I heard a voice saying, Rene, you are being healed. And she said that it is probably Holy Spirit. Claim it. Claim it. You you you'll be healed. So I started claiming it. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm ready to serve the Lord. I'm ready to serve the Lord. That is my turning point. That is my turning point. The doctor said I only have five months left to live. And it was eleven years ago. Here I am. I'm healthy, still skinny. <laughs> I'm still skinny, but I'm healthy. When I was Muslim, I never think about how to live good life. As long as you don't trouble people, you okay. You are okay. But in Christians, it's so different. Show the love of Christ. Love others love others love others whereas in muslim i have been taught about bitterness you take my money i take your money you kill my father i kill your father you kill my brother i kill your, your brother now in christians we are not allowed to hate people that is something big for me to see the difference that uh, we are softened our heart is softened because of that there is uh, something uh, interesting for me and I love that kind of understanding and what the Bible teach us is love others Jesus said that it is normal if you hate your enemy but I tell you now love your enemy and bless them who persecute you see the big difference I am blessed by reading that verse which is in Muslim no we are not taught that way in Christian there is assurance it is so sure Jesus said I am the truth and the way and the life no one can come to the Father except through me I think that is the clearest statement that compared to all religions of the world that the prophet saying that and Quran um, 19 Maryam 19 says that only Nabi Isa goes straight to heaven because he's holy and Muslim believe that the judge at the end of this earth is Isa so why should we doubt about it that is a strong statement that make me Boy, yes, I'm on the right path. I was born into a very religious family. My father was a Muslim scholar and uh, a writer, of course, a, a very known poet. And so I grew up practicing, uh, believing and practicing the Sharia law from beginning, from early ages. As far as I remember, I used to be oh must have been about five or six that I remember uh, first time I prayed my prayer I had to learn it by heart in Arabic language pray it five times every day and during the month of Ramadan I would fast for 30 days and not eat and drink as long as the sun was out and uh, I grew up in that environment very radical my father was very strict uh, no drinking no smoking no nothing and just keeping to the law 
not eating, uh, you know, keeping the diet, dietary laws and so on and so forth. And so I grew up believing strongly Allah was the supreme God, the supreme being. So you worship the supreme being. So uh, that's that's where I grew up, believing and practicing and uh, uh, and uh, really living it. That's that was my life. Islam was my life. As far as back as I remember, as a kid, I used to dream about a society that Allah's rule would reign. And I remember one day driving by the university, and I saw thousands of kids on one side of the street, I mean tens of thousands, locking arms, chanting songs of freedom. On the outside there were radical Muslims with clubs and chains and swords in their hands and they want to they want to kill every one of these so-called communist kids, you know, freedom fighters. And so I realized that they, this is not what Islam should be all about. You know, it's one thing you dream about, it is another thing when it really in reality it's not what you thought that it would be. And at that time I left the country and went to Sweden. In Sweden I met an exchange student uh, and this person was a Christian. And, uh, and that was the beginning of my introduction to the Gospels. And uh, she led me to two Swedish, if you would call them missionaries, but they weren't missionaries because they lived in their hometowns. and reaching out to the Muslim community, just uh, loving the Muslim community. And so I came across uh, their path and uh, at that time I was very confused about my my whole situation, about what my f future is going to hold. And of course these two uh, Swedish family loved me extremely. I mean, and uh, to me they were naive, to me they were weak and uh, I thought to myself, you know what, Again, as a Muslim, you always think that you are supreme, you have the supreme religion, you, you have the supreme law, and so I despise them in my heart. And so, of course, I was lonely in Sweden, and they took me under their wings, took me to their homes and family and their Bible studies, and, and I started faking the, the fact that I, I'm showing interest to them, that I'm interested in Christianity. And so my motives were not pure. And so what they did, they found me a Bible, and that was very interesting for me to read for the first time. Because Muslims, uh, we used to believe that the Bible is tahrif, it's been altered. So uh, reading the Bible was very interesting, especially the miracles of Jesus interested me greatly. Uh, because in Islam there are no supernatural moves. And so seeing Jesus healing all these people and loving all these people, and so that was the beginning of a confusion in me. What if Islam is not from God? The question began in my heart. You know, seeing Christians uh, and being involved with their Bible studies and going from house to house and being loved by these Christians, it's hard for me to describe their love, but it was something I hadn't experienced before. And that, that was intriguing to me to see these people that I'm despising in my heart as lower class, if you would, religious people and me as being a higher class religious person yet they, they showed a greater love, a greater personality, a greater character, forgiveness than I had and all the people that I knew, all those ulamas, all those scientists, all those uh, religious scientists and, and religious leaders and that was that was interesting to me. A question began in my heart. What if these people are right and the Bible is correct? And what if Muhammad was not from God? And that idea just uh, scared the hoop out of me. And I was just, because you as a Muslim, you never even think the idea that Muhammad is not from God, that Islam is not from God. And so a confusion began in my heart for, for days, for weeks, for months. At night I could not go to bed without having a light in the house on because I was so afraid of darkness. I was so afraid that God would come and kill me and send me to hell. Just questioning. And uh, that, was, that was tough for me. At night struggling, reading the Bible and praying. And, and there was a turmoil within me. And, uh, and one night I prayed this prayer. 
I said, God, I don't know who you are. And so, Jesus, I don't know who you are. The Bible says you're the son of God, which is really hard for a Muslim to believe. If you are what you say you are in the scripture, what these Christians says you are, if you rose from the dead, if you are God, then you should hear this prayer I'm praying. And if not, then God, I'm praying to you. Show me the way. Show me which is the way. I want to know the truth. That confusion went on for six months. That fear went on for six months. And reading the Quran, reading the Bible, I couldn't, I couldn't come to that conclusion, which is the way. And so I asked for a supernatural visitation. I said to Jesus, I said, if you are the Son of God, show yourself to me. If you're alive, you should hear this prayer. If you're God, you should be able to hear this prayer. And that night I went to bed asleep. Uh, this was in Sweden. And in Sweden, uh, you know, you have one of my prayer has to be done in the early morning before the sunrise. And I had to get up early because the sun would break. This is the summertime. Sun would break about uh, 3, 3.30. So I was up about 2.30 or so. Washing myself. As I sat on my bed, I heard the voice of God for the first time in my life. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was an internal knowing. And the voice said, Reza, you don't need to pray like this anymore. Your sins are forgiven you. And it wasn't so much what I heard, it was so much what I felt. For the first time in my life, I felt peace. You know, I used to travel 18 hours by train to go to a shrine of a dead Imam in the city of Mashhad. Hang on to that shrine for a whole week, pray day and night to get one answer to my prayer. And I would never get an answer to prayer. But here I prayed one prayer in Jesus' name. And the following day God spoke to me. And that was just, that, that just, something opened up. It was like a veil removed from my eyes. I had no struggle with the Trinity whatsoever. I had no longer any struggle that Jesus was God. And He appeared and for God can do whatever He wants to. And He came in flesh. He became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. And so again, it was kind of a, again, as I said, it was that knowing dropped in my spirit. First thing, first thing I did after that experience, I went to these Christians and I asked them for, for forgiveness. I told them that how I treated them in my heart and how I tried to, uh, you know, deceive them and mislead them and so on and so forth. And so that was the beginning of a change in me. And they said to me, they said, Reza, we knew it all along. And yet they loved me. And that was, again, that was intriguing to me, their pure love. And uh, an incredible hunger began in my heart after, after that experience. I would stay up till late into the night, two, three o'clock in the morning, and just read the scripture. Just that same zeal that I had for the God of, of the Quran, I had now for the God of the Bible. And so I would read the Bible and I would pray, and uh, just pray for hours. And again, one of the greatest interesting things for me was Jesus' miracles. And of course, the group that I got together was the charismatic group. And, you know, they believed in healings. And so I want to always see this. I, that, that was an, an, uh, an incredible force in my heart about to see the miracles of Jesus. So I started witnessing to other Muslims and praying for their sick people. And Again, as a Muslim, Islam is your being, Islam is your culture, it's your mindset, it's the way you think, it's the way you act. And God had to cleanse all of that out of me. And there was three things God didn't like about me. Everything I said, everything I thought, and everything I did. Because it was a cleansing process. But then, the more I walked, the more I saw the light. My heart was not as hard as it used to be. And something had happened, and that was the beginning of the change in me love had come into my heart for other people it was amazing I noticed that you know it wasn't it wasn't me again it was you know us again we're the supreme we're blah 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 it was other people now and that change began in my heart recognizing that God loves all people and that's when you know you really saved you are born again uh, the Bible says because it's the love of God in us and the first fruit of the Spirit of God is love, because God is love. That hatred went away. That, that backbiting, that deceiving spirit, that lying, that, that just died in me. And I'm not telling you overnight it happened, it was just a process of changing and maturing. But something had been changing my spirit.
reaching to a Muslim, speaking to a Muslim, I always come to those points that are important. And of course the key point is Jesus. The whole key is Jesus. That Jesus wasn't a prophet, that he was more than a prophet, that he was God that came into the flesh. Well then, again, if he was God, what's the re why the reason? The reason for God becoming a flesh, becoming a man. And those points are very important points of reaching out to a Muslim, talking to a Muslim, that our sins, the good works, cannot deliver us from our sins. You know, talking, for instance, I always give him this example that if a judge forgives a criminal, a, a murderer, uh, let's say, on a presidential pardon or say okay I'm a good judge and I'm gonna let you go we're gonna forgive you by forgiveness that person's nature hasn't changed so forgiveness doesn't change a person nature that's the difference between Christianity and Islam one of the major differences is that in Islam says God will forgive you if your good deeds are more than your bad deeds but the person doesn't change forgiveness doesn't change a person Whereas in Christ, in Christianity, Christ doesn't only forgive us, but He moves that heart of sin away from us, that old man, the nature away from us. He crucifies that old man on the cross. And this point is the key point in produce or introducing the gospel to a Muslim. You know, Muslims say the Bible has been tahrifed or it's been corrupt. My question is, when was Bible Tahrif? So this is a very intellectual point. Let's discuss it. You say it's been changed, when was it changed? Was it during the time of Jesus? Or was it during the time of Muhammad? Well, it couldn't be during the time of Muhammad because Muhammad said in Quran, if you defer anything in what we have to say, refer to the books prior to us. Well, he's referring to the, the Bible. So at that time, the Bible was okay. Now Muhammad came in 570, 570 years after Jesus. Actually the Quran came in 610. His revelation came, Muhammad was born in 570, the revelation of the Quran came to him the first time in 610. 600 years had passed by and there, at that time there were millions of copies of the Bibles that Muhammad referred to, the Holy Angel, all over this planet. So then the Tahrif, the changing, must have happened after Muhammad's death, which was 632. So, in order for some corrupt Christians, so what Muslim believe, to change the Bible, they had to collect millions of the Bibles from all over this planet, change it, and then send it back. I mean, that's not logical. So, the idea of that when they say the Bible has been tahrif, why do they say it? Because the Bible contradicts the revelation of the Quran. And so it's very easy to say, oh, okay, this is not what Jesus brought. And uh, again, it doesn't, it doesn't hold water. It doesn't make sense. Islam is based upon the teaching of Islam. You know, if you want to compare it with other religions, Moses had the perfect law, the law of Moses. You cannot beat that law. It's got everything to the dots and commas of the law. And so Islam couldn't come and say it's a more perfect revelation. Really, if you want to compare it, let's sit down and compare the two religions, uh, Judaism and, and Islam. And I promise you, with my knowledge of two religions, that Judaism can beat any other law on this planet. So it wasn't, Jesus wasn't about the law. He came to fulfill the law. He came to bring the salvation that we cannot, as human beings, reach God, it's impossible. You know, as a Muslim, I did everything as a kid. I was so zealous for God. I would beat myself at night for hours with chains every night. I would fast as a little kid for 18 hours daily without drinking water. Toward the evening when the sun was setting, my knees would shake because of dehydration. But I couldn't approach, I, I couldn't hear God. All of those years of 20 years of praying and fasting, I couldn't hear God. Man cannot approach God. All have seen the scriptures says, and come short of the glory of God. But in Christ, through Christ, God accomplished that salvation. And so by me believing in Him and trusting Him, what He did will be imputed to my account. 
And so in other words, God did an exchange between Jesus and me. He put me on his place, he put him on my place. And he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, 2 Corinthians 5.21. That we through him might become the righteousness of God. And that's another key. We cannot come to heaven unless we are in the same nature as God. You know, when you marry someone, you don't go marry a dog or a cat or a donkey or an animal because they're not of the same nature as you. How would God allow a sinful man that is against his nature, allow him to come to heaven? That's why in Islam there is not much talk about the afterlife because there is no description of that afterlife. God is a holy God. So in order for us to have fellowship eternally with God, our nature must change. We must become one with God and the Bible calls that rightness of God, righteousness. And Jesus did that for me. He made me God's righteousness through his dying on the cross through his cross, through his resurrection, through his death and resurrection. He, the Bible says he was, offend, he was given up for our offenses and raised up for our justification. So those are key elements. And of course, you know, you all always have to have an attractive point of uh, introduction to Muslim. And that point is miracles. There are no miracles in Islam. Jesus does miracles today. You know, when it comes to the uh, divinity of Christ, I don't have to prove anything to them. I usually say, here, is, here are the key points. Here's Jesus. Jesus said in, in John chapter 6, He said, some of you, unless you don't see signs and wonders, you by no means will believe. I tell them, listen, if you question that about the Jesus is God, ask Him. Let Him prove it to you. And you know, uh, we, need, we need the supernatural power of God just like my mother that came first time after four years of thinking I'm mentally crazy wouldn't want to do anything with me they actually tried to put me in a mental hospital in Sweden the first time I saw her after four years she decided to come and see me the, the first day she, I, I saw her touching her arm she said she had pain in her arm rheumatism I said here it is here's the key I lay hands on her without asking her anything. I said, Mama, Jesus Christ of Nazareth heals you. That day, the Lord took that pain away from her. From that day, she kept saying, I don't understand this, the pain is gone. And from that day on, there was no argument whether I'm crazy or not, you know. That was the point of her coming out of Islam and believing in Christ because she saw the supernatural. My sister, recently I saw her in Turkey, arguing with me about my faith all the time. After all the argument was over, she says, I cannot get away from this. And when I studied your service, my, my hands got healed, even though you didn't lay hands on me. And what is this? So again, there is no argument with the supernatural. And Muhammad did, did not do any supernatural healings or there is no supernatural. But in Christianity, we have the Holy Ghost. We have the power of God. And he is the agent, the Holy Spirit, the agent to show them what the truth are. We preach the truth, but then He will convict them. He will show them the, about the divinity of Jesus, who Jesus is. I was born and raised in a Muslim uh, family. Uh, my parents are very devout Muslims. I uh, spent the first uh, 19 years of my life being around them, and uh, we were encouraged to practice Islam. Uh, so, like most of uh, kids my own age, uh, I tried to do the, the prayers, uh, to learn all the phrases in Arabic. We studied the Quran for the f three years of uh, high school. Uh, we were taught to uh, revere God, Allah, and uh, uh, we grew up believing that there was only one God and He is the Creator. You get to heaven by your good deeds. However, uh, you don't know how much good deeds you have to do to get there. You're constantly uh, questioning uh, what's going to happen when you get to the other side. But as a young man, I wasn't so much uh, concerned about uh, heaven and hell at the time because young people don't think about dying very much. However, you, you do think about this God uh, who uh, uh, we're raised to feel that if you're happy, He will sure find you and make you unhappy. 
so you have to live in such a way not to provoke him to anger. So you live uh, in a constant fear of uh, uh, don't laugh too much because he will make sure that he will stabilize you. And if you're sad, he'll make you happy. But mostly it's uh, sadness that, that covers uh, that part of, uh, of my life that I remember. That uh, um, being sad was a good thing. It's being happy that you started to question whether God was going to get you or not. Although it's unusual for a Muslim to pray directly to God, I would ask him every night to make me angrier and that help me not to ever smile or laugh. Most of families are very close-knit. Leaving your family is not an easy thing to do. So when I had to leave my family to go to school, uh, that period of my life became the hardest time of my life. Education brings honor. The higher your education, the more honorable you are. And that's why majority of uh, uh, Muslim families you know uh, have their kids in college or they're insisting that they'll, they'll go to college. Uh, you have to have a degree pasted on the wall somewhere. Uh, I wanted to become an engineer. So when I left my parents, um, I went to, to college and I wasn't doing well. My grades were very bad. As hard as I studied, I could not live up to the standard that the culture had made for me. Not my parents, but the culture. My poor parents really didn't care as long as I was happy, but I had put that upon myself. And uh, the first two years being away from them was very, very hard time, to the point that um, because we come from shame-based culture, uh, anything that creates shame needs to be removed so the honor can be restored. Uh, that's why you see parents killing their own children who have done something wrong because they've brought dishonor on the family so now they have to restore it by removing that which has restored, uh, created the dishonor. I was creating a dishonor for my family with my bad grades and I hated myself and I wanted to kill myself. I came to the point of um, the thought of dying was the most soothing thought I had. Very depressed and suicidal. I was too chicken to put a gun to my head or do something crazy, but uh, if someone was to do that for me, I would have been very happy. Right around this time, I ran into a group of people who were very much different than everyone else I had met up to that point of my life. There are two things I always wanted, peace and joy. Uh, it wasn't so much that the lifestyle was very radical than everyone else, but it was something that would emanate, that would just come out of them. And when I asked them, when I approached them, why is it that you're different than the rest of the people that I know? They said, it's because we've decided to follow Jesus Christ. Well, that was a very offensive answer to me because as a Muslim, uh, how can a second class prophet give you that piece of joy when my uh, last religion and Allah and, and uh, the Quran and, and, and Muhammad cannot give me that peace? So I began to argue with them. Uh, and, and, but they, they never argued back with me. What they did instead, they loved me. Uh, they didn't know much about my background, so they allowed me to hang around with them. And I remember, as long as I was with them, I could feel the peace that was among them. But I would go home crying. This went on uh, for a while, and uh, until uh, one of them invited me to their house one night for dinner. I had bought myself a motorcycle by that time, uh, thinking that maybe I run into an accident and kill myself and they wouldn't think that I deliberately did that. So I rode my bike for about two hours to get to that place and when we sat down to eat, the father of the house blessed the food, prayed over the meal. I had never heard people pray. I don't even remember what he prayed, but it was that prayer that touched my heart. So after months of arguing with these people, on the way home, as I'm riding my motorcycle 80, 90 miles an hour, I began to have a conversation with God. Now, which God do you think I was conversing with? Of course it was Allah. That was the only God I knew. And this is what I said. I said, God, I'm a Muslim and I'm on the verge of wanting to kill myself. I know nothing about Christianity. I know nothing about Christ. In fact, everything I knew as a Muslim about Jesus was exactly the opposite of what these people believed. He wasn't divine. He never died on the cross. He wasn't the Son of God. So I said, Jesus, 
if you really who these people tell me you are, please understand I know nothing about Christianity. If you really do who these people tell me you are, I will accept you. I want him to remove my shame and good grades would bring me honor. That's what I wanted them to do. I had no idea about Christian theology. I just knew if anyone could get me out of the mess I was in, it would be Jesus. And this was the extent of my prayer and, and the knowledge I had of him. Uh, I find it interesting that I prayed to Allah and Jesus came up. Uh, the next day when I went to school and asked a friend, how does one become a Christian? He said, all you need to do is to invite Christ into your heart. I said, I did that yesterday. What else do I need to do? Uh, as imperfect as my communication with God was, I, I believe He met me where I was. Once I decided to follow Jesus, the next step was to learn more about Him, which was reading the Bible. So I began to read the Bible. And many of the phrases, many of the uh, stories were strange to me. Uh, nevertheless, I was very much intrigued by who Jesus was. Uh, I'm so glad in a way that no one tried to put words in my mouth, no one told me what to do. It was all by the direction of God, through Jesus, what I was supposed to do next. So um, I came to the conclusion that I needed to get baptized. And, and uh, so a few months after I had become a believer, uh, I got baptized. As I got to know Jesus, I realized that good grades were not that important anymore. One night as I was lying down on bed, I had just finished about Jesus walking on water. Uh, I began to think about my future and I heard a voice saying, Son, don't you think that the man who walks on water can also take care of your grades? Uh, so, uh, now I had hope. Now I had the peace and the joy that my, that my friends had. Now I knew I could deal with the problems that were facing me. I knew that although my problems were real, that Jesus was able to walk me through it. It wasn't so much that He was going to solve all my problems, but He was going to be standing there with me. I, I didn't have to solve and face these problems by myself. Uh, uh, I used to have an ulcer. And once I began to follow Christ, gradually, because that uh, 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 power of shame was lifted, because that weight on my back, that yoke was taken away by Jesus, then uh, eventually my, my stress went away and, and the pain uh, of ulcer went away and, and God healed me. But it's a process and the more I got to know Him, the greater the peace God. To the point today that I, I realize life is full of problems, uh, but I have hope that I, I'm not facing it alone and if I never have an answer, I still trust that God is in charge, that He is not taking it out on me and He is not trying to punish me for something, but in fact, He is with me to help me face the problems of life. I was flying from uh, 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 Syria to Lebanon. I sat next to him. Arab gentleman and we began to uh, converse. He was a Muslim and I told him about what a friend of mine had told me uh, uh, in Jordan. This is the story that my friend told me. He said his next door neighbor shot his own sister on the street seven times uh, on, uh, during the day with everyone witnessing it and he waited until the police showed up, gave him his gun and they let him go because it was honor killing. His sister was caught in adultery and he had to remove that which had brought shame to the family. By killing her, he had restored the honor. And I asked the Arab gentleman sitting next to me, I said, do you think he, the man did the right thing? And he said, oh, by God, yes, of course. I would have done the same thing myself. I said, have you ever done anything to bring shame on God? He thought a little bit and being an honest man that he was, he said, yes, I have. I said, do you think God should destroy you to restore the honor to Himself again? He said, yes. If it wasn't because of His mercy, yes, He should. I said, is it possible for Him to put your shame on someone else and destroy Him to bring His honor back? He thought a little bit, he said, it's a possibility. I said, what if He did that with Jesus on the cross? That was just a question. I did not expect an answer from him. I think one of the things that my friends have to realize, again, this is a process. What our job is to share 
the good news of Jesus with people. It is God's job to take that seed and cause it to germinate in their lives. Uh, I think my uh, uh, suggestion to my Muslim friends the same thing. Give Jesus a chance. I would like you to ask yourself who's going to remove the shame that I'm dealing with in my life. Jesus died on the cross so he can remove you from the place of shame to a position of honor so that you can have the honor that God would like you to have with him. I was born and raised in a Muslim home with Muslim family. My father, mother, everybody were all practicing Muslim. Um, at a very tender age, we, we always go to Islamic school where uh, we would learn to recite the Quran and learn about the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. And I grew up in that environment. It was a very happy time for me. It was good because um, our family was very close-knit. But as I, I get older in my teenage years and practicing Islam, I begin to see things differently and I ask a lot of questions which at times were not answered, but I still, um, it didn't really bother me that much. We would go to the mosque every evening and we would keep the month of Ramadan and we would keep all the Eid, Eid um, holidays and do whatever it takes to be a Muslim. Um, my questions were, were a lot, but I still kept with the religion because that was what I was born uh, with. And as I grew older, it meant more to me to be a Muslim, especially to be a Muslim woman. And um, I was very proud of it. And um, But um, one of the things that bothered me was that I was very fearful as a Muslim of death. And um, I, um, because of that, and um, the language barrier with, with the Quran being Arabic and I speaking English, um, I couldn't, I feel that I couldn't communicate with God. There was not a communication between me and God. God was very distant to me as, as, as a Muslim. And um, I didn't feel it at growing up. I didn't feel that distance between me and God. But as I get older and I search more, I felt that I was so far away from the God of Islam, from Allah. I was exposed to Christianity at a very young age when I was 11. My brother accepted the Lord. I mean, at that time I didn't know what it was, but he was very close with me. And when he would go to church, I would go with him. And although at that time I didn't know who Christ was, I just enjoyed going to Sunday school. So as I got older, and especially when I got married, I got married into a Muslim family also. And it was more so um, required of me as a married woman to keep going to the mosque and to keep all the traditions and to keep reading my namaz and keeping fast and all of that. But um, like I say, I enjoyed it, but in a ritualistic way. It, it, it didn't mean that much to me again, because all my prayers were recited. The morning prayer, the, the midday prayer, the evening prayer, it was all recited. Even, even though we had a translation, it was like, I just go in and reading a book and come back out, you know. There, there was no connection between me and my God. Even when I pray, there was nothing there. But I, I really, really did not feel a connection with me and the God I was serving. I couldn't feel it at all. But I, I didn't mention it to anyone because I was afraid to, um, to tell anyone. But there came a point in my life that on a particular day when I really, really was at a crossroads. And I remember distinctly I was in the mosque. We were doing the evening namaz and um, I was praying and I just wanted to talk to God in my own language and I was so confused while I was battling with this in my pre evening prayer in the mosque the words of my Sunday school teacher came to me that if you ask anything in Jesus name he will give it to you and that point was when I say Lord Jesus I and I gave him all all the burden that was in my heart that day and I really felt relief just to say Jesus that day meant it made a difference. It was like I felt a connection to someone out there. And um, that was a turning point for me, although I did not share it with anyone in my family. My instinct that evening, I remember, was to turn around and run out of the mosque, but I couldn't do it.
suitcase to my right and to my left were my husband's cousins and I, I knew I couldn't do it so I stayed there but when I went home in my own closed door I was so happy but I didn't tell anyone I didn't tell my husband or anyone but that was my breaking point for me a way to talk to God just to talk to Jesus and to pour my heart out to him and to tell him all that I want it make a big difference in my life I still keep going to the mosque and um, I um, still keep practicing Islam until um, it was getting to a point that I couldn't do that anymore. I really couldn't do it. I was so yearning to go to a Christian church. All I wanted to do was go to a Christian church, was to read the Bible and hear about Jesus. And um, when I got that chance, the preacher was preaching and he was just telling how we were born sinners. And then I realized that I needed Jesus. And then that yearning that I was feeling, you know, I, I knew that this was what I wanted. And um, the assurance of salvation was what really touched my heart. That if I put my trust in Jesus, and He would forgive my sins, and I'm on my way to heaven. At, at the end of his preaching, the preacher was asking that whoever wants to accept Jesus in their heart, don't wait that tonight is the night. And that was when I decided to go up there and publicly tell them that I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And they prayed with me. And um, But even though I did it there publicly, it was a personal thing that was going on in my heart for a long time. But I found a relationship with the Lord. E even at the beginning, I knew that this Jesus, that, I was, that um, my Savior, that he was so close to me than Allah who I was serving because he was always distant. That night I really, really knew who Jesus was and that he came and, and died for me, and a, a sinner like me. Um, my life has changed so much, so, so much. Because if, if anyone knew me as a Muslim, I don't think they would want to know me, <laughs> who I really was. And I didn't change overnight. It took a long, long time for all the different changes to, um, to take place in my life. I was a person that had a very, very bad temper, very angry person all the time, I guess because I grew up with a stepmother, so I was angry all the time. I hated my father for years, but after I read the Bible and Christ said we must forgive, I really prayed and asked God, can you let me forgive my father? It took me a year, but I really felt when I forgive my father that I did. And if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for the Bible, I would not have able, been able to for, forgive my dad. And um, I, I, I really changed as a human being. My whole outlook in life changed gradually. I became a nicer person. I, uh, um, I, I became more, more understanding. On, on the whole, um, but I see life different. I, and it didn't happen overnight, it, it took time, especially when I, I read the Bible it, and words just open up to you and, and, and the way Christ taught. And even Psalm 139, when I read it, and it says that we were, I was fearfully and wonderfully made, that even when I was in my mother's womb, God knew who I was, who I was going to be, and He knew all my days. And you know, life hasn't been easy. Um, not because I accept Christ, I, I, I live a, a stress-free life, happy. All, uh, there is that joy, but life has been one trial after the other in, in, in my life. But God has took me through all. He didn't take my trials away from me, but He took me through every step of the way. And with each trials in my life, I get to know Jesus more and more, and I get to experience his love more in, um, in my life. When I was a Muslim, I didn't know that I was a born sinner. I didn't know that I had sin in my life because all I was taught was that if, I be a, if I'm a good person, if I keep the seven pillars of Islam, I read my namaz, I keep the month of Ramadan, I give alms and I be a good person, that that is what Allah wanted. But yet again, that was one of my questions, when I die, where I will go? And no one could have answered that question because even my, my teacher that taught me the Quran, she says it's up to Allah where we would go when we die. And that used to bother me. And, and one of the, um, the things that left me was my fear of dying. 
because no one knew, but I was so fearful of dying when I was in, in Islam. And um, I, I knew that day, when I give my heart to Jesus, that if I should die, whatever time, I'll be with my Lord in heaven, because I have that assurance, and I did not get that assurance. In, in, um, I remember in Islam, there was no mention of sin at all. It was all like wrongdoings. If you do something wrong, but if you keep, keep the month of Ramadan and you give your arms, it would be covered over, you know. But if you, when yeah, I start to think logically, how can this be possible, you know? Um, well, like I've shared with, with my family, because they're all still Muslim ex except one brother. And um, that, that I think most of them have a, has a closed mind that who Jesus is, because in Islam, you cannot associate anyone with Allah. And to say that Allah had a son is, is like they say, unclean. So um, my, um, my thoughts for them out there is that um, if, you, if you really seek God, you will find Him. You have, if you really seek Him with an open mind, because we cannot convince anyone who Jesus is. It, it's, I think it's an individual thing that someone has to be really searching, really searching for who God is. And if you look in the right place, if, give, like I would just say, give Jesus a chance. Just read about who He is. Open the Bible with an open mind. And most of all, pray and ask the Lord, is this true what these people are saying who Jesus is? And I could tell you without a shadow of a doubt, God will let you know who Jesus really is, that He is our Savior. The only way to eternal life, there is no other way, there is, is absolutely no other way to have eternal life or to have the assurance that if we should die today, we'll, we'll go to heaven. No, no other way. No other religion will take us there. Nothing else. Only, only Jesus. He is who He said He is. And we, we just have to believe it by faith, you know. And, and like I say, if we would only stop and think, when this life is over, what next? What next? And when I was an, uh, um, a Muslim, there was no answer for me, what next? But now that I trust Jesus, I know that what next? I'll be in the arms of my Savior. I'll be in heaven.